Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Hrve. Uh, I come from Croatia and I'm, I'm a Java developer at a company called Five. Uh, now, first of all, uh, please raise your hand if you already worked with Rx Java. How many? Okay, not many. Great. I mean, this presentation won't be, won't be very fun for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> but for the rest of you, I hopefully it will. Okay, so the subject of my presentation is going reactive with Rx Java. Uh, but before we be, before we begin, uh, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, number one, I will not give you any vague or confusing definitions of what Rx Java is or should be. If you want that, then please visit Wikipedia, right? And the second thing is, uh, this is not a summary of the Rx Java API. If you want that, then please visit the Rx Java API. Instead, in the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes, we will we'll actually we'll talk about the concept, the ideas, and the concepts that drive Rx Java. So all you need to know for now is that Rx Java is a Java library, right? And that it can be used to make your apps more reactive. But, but first, we need to ask ourselves, what does it actually mean for an app to be reactive? Uh, you know, in the last few years, uh, this term reactive became very popular. Popular, and, you know, it became one of those buzzwords like agile, big data, and stuff like that. You know, everybody's talking about it and everybody's doing it, but nobody actually knows what it means. So let's try and, de let's try and demystify this word. First, is, it, is, is this anything new? No, definitely not, and it doesn't claim to be. Uh, let's look at an example. Let's say we have an app that waits for an input of two integers, and then it reacts by multiplying those, in, in, those integers. Well, basically, that's a reactive app, right? I mean, just by definition of the word reactive, this app is reactive, right? So. Uh, we can say that our apps have actually always been reactive. I mean, it's nothing new. Our apps, our apps have always reacted to something, right? But how reactive is our app? How do we handle uh, pressure? How do we handle failure? How fast can we respond? Okay, so these are the questions. These are the real questions. These are the questions that separate good reactive apps from the bad ones. So we could say that we need a set of requirements that each good reactive app should meet. And in comes His Majesty, the Reactive Manifesto. I you might have heard of it. Okay, so in the last few years, this manifesto became very popular as the source of these requirements. So according to the manifesto, each reactive app should be uh, message driven. So all the components in our system communicate exclusively via asynchronous messages. We should also be resilient. So our system stays responsive in the face of failure. You know, so, so no blue screen of death, no oops, something went wrong pages. We are always responsive. We should also be scalable, so it doesn't matter if it's 100 customers or 1,000 customers, we always respond, right? And we should also be responsive. Right now, you're probably saying to, to yourself, but hey, he already said responsive twice, and yes, I did, but it's not the same if you respond in two seconds or in two minutes. So this last requirement tells us that time does matter, and we should always uh, respond in a timely manner. But you know, we are graphical people, so let's put this all in a diagram. And it goes something like this. So as you can see at the bottom, we have the message driven communication. And actually, this type of loosely coupled communication will help us achieve all the other goals, as we'll see later, of course. But uh, OK, so now we have our requirements. But this is, a, this is an, a Java conference, right? And I presume that most of you here are Java developers. And Java is an object-oriented language, primarily. So let's see how object-oriented paradigm can respond to these requirements. And it goes something like this. So green would be good, yellow is okay, let's say, and red is not that, red is bad, basically. Um, now, before you start throwing stuff at me, I'm not saying that you cannot make good reactive apps using, uh, using object-oriented paradigm. Of course you can, I'm just saying that it's a little bit harder to do so, okay? Why? Well, here's my reasoning for that. Message driven communication. Okay, I mean, most uh, object-oriented apps are event-driven, so fine, we'll just pack our events into messages. No big deal, right? Scalability. Well, I have two problems with that. The first one is that uh, state and behavior are joined together, you know, objects. And the second thing is that state is mutable. And it's very hard to do things in parallel when you're mutable. Long story short, you'll get in a lot of trouble. No. That's scalability. Uh, now let's talk about resilience. Well, my problem with resilience is that error handling is up to the client. So if, and by client, I mean a caller of some service. 
So you as a client, you need to think about try-catch blocks, you need to think about uh, resource management and stuff like that. And, you, and clients are lazy, you know. We don't like to think about the worst-case scenario. We don't like to think about those, those sorts of stuff. We're only, we're only interested in the happy, in happy parts, right? But when the error occurs, and it will eventually, then, that's when, then we'll have a problem. And the last thing would be responsiveness. Well, I would actually say, I would argue that uh, object-oriented apps are pretty responsive most of the time. So actually, it's yellow, but it's actually OK. So this one is OK. But the rest, we'll, talk, we'll see how we can improve on them. OK, so how can RxJava help us with all of this? Let's see, right? Uh, first, uh, we need to switch from an event-driven model to a message-driven one. So as we said, uh, as the reactive manifesto says, everything should be a message. And uh, this includes error. And so each component in our system can be a message producer and a message consumer. So for example, for a producer, we can have, uh, let's say, some UI component, some remote service, some scheduled job, or something like that. Then for messages, we can have events, uh, computation results, uh, query results, something like that. And consumer is whoever subscribed. Yeah, it's raining here. <laughs> yeah, nice. OK. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't prepare myself for that. OK, now back to our, back to our uh, presentation. OK, so now we define producer, consumer, and messages. We, uh, right, now, right now, I would also like to introduce the notion of streams of messages. So each time a producer sends something to a consumer, it's a stream of messages. If it's one message, then it's a stream of one message. And if it's n messages, that's, then it's a stream of n messages. But each time, it's a stream, right? OK. So now that we have the theory, let's see how we can implement all of this in RxJava. And it goes something like this, right? So in order, in order to implement, so in order to, impl to implement these stream of streams of messages, RxJava introduced uh, two abstractions. The first one is observable, which is, a which is a representation of the message producer. And the second one is observer, which is a representation of the message consumer. I'll just keep using uh, the terms producer and consumer because it's very hard to say observable and observer in the same sentence and not get confused. Believe me, I tried. So we'll just stick with producer and consumer. OK, so how, how, so how does this communication work? So each time our producer wants to send a message to our consumer, it will call the consumer's on next method. And so for example, if we have 10, met 10 messages that we want to send to our consumer, we'll just call the consumer's uh, on next method 10 times, and that is it. Once our producer is done with, with sending messages, and it's got no more messages to send to our consumer, it is producer's responsibility to call the consumer on completed method and thus notifying the consumer that there will be no more messages from this producer. So as you can see, on complete is a terminal method. There will be nothing from this producer after that call. So this is a happy part, right? If for some reason something goes horribly wrong on the producer, then again, it's producer's responsibility to call the consumer's own error method. And again, thus notifying the consumer that something horribly that something went horribly wrong on the producer, and again, that there will be no more mes messages from these producers. producer. So in both cases, on completed then on error methods are terminal methods. That's important for later, trust me. Okay, so now, th so now that we know how this producer-consumer thing works, let's, let's try and implement a producer, or in RxJava terms, an observable. Well, first of all, there's a whole bunch of predefined methods for that, you know. Uh, the observable class alone has more than 300 methods, you know, so I don't intend to go through all of them, right? There are methods like from which take uh, collections and uh, then transform each element of these collections, of this collection into a message. Then you have methods like just or interval, which periodically produce elements, range. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of methods. And this is all great. I mean, this is all nice. But the, re the real power lies in, in the method called observable.create. Why? Well, because with that method, we, could, we can create our own observables, you know, our own definition of observables, of message producers. How do we do that? Again, it's actually quite simple. All we have to do is call the observable.create method, and as an input parameter, we give in an implementation of our message producer. And that's it. So for example, in this case, in this very simple case, our producer will call some service to get the data, then it will push the data down our stream using the onNext method, 
then after it's done, it will call the uncompleted method. And of course, if something goes wrong, then we have this try catch, and it's and in the catch clause, we'll call the consumer's own error method. And in this case, we pushed only one message. But if you wanted to push, let's say, 10, message, we would, 10 messages, we would just put a while loop or for loop or whatever, and we'll we would just iteratively push 10 messages. No big deal, right? And uh, as you can see, uh, all of these methods, on next, on completed, and on, on, on error, are being called on the subscriber object. Uh, subscriber is observer plus a few other methods, okay? Uh, we'll talk about these few other methods later. So all you need to know for now is the subscriber is, let's say, extended observer. And that is it for now. Okay, so now we have our producer. Now let's implement our consumer. Again, at its core, it's very simple. How do we do that? Well, we have our observable instance, and all we have to do is call the subscribe method on our observable instance. And as an input parameter to that, to that method, we give in a, an, imp an implementation of the observer interface. And this interface has three methods. It's the on next, on error, and on completed, as you might have imagined, right? Uh, now, this is pre-Java 8. If you want Java 8, then it, it gets even simpler. It goes something like this. So three lambda expressions for three methods. And that's it. That's all the magic. Okay, now back to our diagram. Only this time, uh, we added Arc Java to our object-oriented paradigm. So in order to handle message during communication, we, inter we introduced observer as the message consumer and observable as the message producer. Now let's tackle scalability. Now that's a little bit hard to do, so. Um, scalability. Uh, well, first, I would like to define the term scalability. I mean. Scalability is again one of those one of those things. You know, everybody everybody's talking about it, and everybody everybody is doing it. But again, nobody knows what what it actually means. Okay, so let's try let's let's d d d define the term scalability on a very very simple basis, just so that we so just so that we are all on the same page here. So for me, scalability is basically the ability of the app to take advantage of stronger hardware. So let's say that we have. Uh, Let's look at an example. Let's say we have an app that uses uh, one gigabyte of RAM, of RAM and two cores. And it can handle, let's say, a thousand uh, concurrent customers. Uh, we are into, uh, basically, scalability, scalability means that, uh, scalability means that, you know, what will happen if we, we add, let's say, instead of one gigabyte of RAM, we put in two gigabytes of RAM. Instead of two cores, we give in four cores. What will happen then? How many, how many customers will be able to, will, be, will we be able to handle then? So this is basically scalability. You know, as we increase the hardware, how much better will our, will our application, how much better will our, will our, will our application be? There are actually two ways of, of approaching this problem. We can scale up. Basically, this means that uh, uh, our the num so we are in this case we would still have one gigabyte of RAM and we, we would still have two cores only. But uh, in this case, uh, the frequencies on which those uh, this hardware work would be higher. So basically, our, our hardware would stay the same, but it would be it would work faster. Now the problem with this approach is that it's very is that it's very expensive. Uh, so hardware like that is expensive. So We'll just cross that out, and we'll, we'll not, uh, we'll, we will not use that. So instead, we'll scale out. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that, that means that we'll just buy a bunch of cheap commodity hardware and give it to our app. So instead of having one gigabyte of RAM, of RAM we'll have four gigabytes of RAM. And instead of uh, having two cores, we'll have eight cores. You know, just a bunch of cheap commodity hardware. OK, so the desired characteristics of our system, of our app, would be that Programming logic should execute in parallel. Why? Well, because we have a lot of cores. And uh, that data immutability is allowed slash encouraged. Why is it allowed? Well, it's allowed because we have a lot of memory, so we can afford the overhead. And it's encouraged, well, because it's just easier to do stuff in parallel if you're immutable, right? Now, the, the natural answer to that would be functional programming. I know, I know, it's a sad day, it's a sad day when, you have to, when you have to tell the a Java developer that he needs to go functional, huh? But it is what it is. Why FP approach? Uh, well, first of all, in functional programming, state is handled transparently. And by transparently, I mean that there is no state as such. I mean, you have an object. Basically, if you want to change the state of that object, you'll just have to create a new object, right? 
and because of that, uh, functions in functional programming are side effect free. You know, you don't have to worry about uh, your, your function changing your object because it physically can't change your object. And because of this side effect free uh, thing, uh, it is very hard, it is very easy to chain a bunch of functions together. You'll just chain a bunch of functions together and then an output of one function will be an input to another. And this is what we want, this is what we want in our RxJava. So when we apply this to our RxJava world, in order to manipulate data, we would introduce a bunch of composable FP style, so side effect free presumably methods. And in order to handle a change of state, we would uh, use streams basically. So each change of state would be another message in our stream, right? So that we avoid mutability. Now, as you might have imagined, there's a whole bunch of predefined uh, composable methods in RxJava. Uh, and now, before we, before we go, before we do a short overview of them, I would just like to say that each of these methods uh, takes a stream as an input and produces a new stream as an output, okay? So this is that side effect free part of the method. So input is one stream, output is another stream. And uh, each of these methods, as you might have imagined, is chainable. So you can chain them together uh, however you like. There are, actually, there are actually four categories of methods. The first category is, uh, the first category are methods for content filtering. So basically, uh, your output stream, uh, you, you, so you, you put, an input stream is, uh, you get, uh, uh, out your output stream is, uh, uh, your output stream are those messages that actually, that pass your filter. So for example, you can filter by, by some parameter, or you can, I don't know, skip a first 10 messages, take a first 10 messages, and stuff like that. So these are content filtering messages. Sorry, methods. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot about that. And then we have methods for time filtering. Uh, well, basically, these methods uh, filter our messages based on time, you know, like some throttling, timeouts, intervals, and stuff like that. Then we have methods for transformation. Well, basically, these methods uh, transform uh, our input messages into something else, you know, stuff like that. And then we have the last, the last uh, group of, message, of methods are uh, methods for combining streams. And using these methods, we can basically take, I don't know, an n, n number of streams, and then we can, we can apply, we can uh, merge them together in some special way, you know, based on the method that we use, uh, different, different approach to merging will, will be applied. Okay, so now, uh, this is, this is a short example. So as you can see, at the beginning, we have a stream of nine elements, basically of nine messages, and then we just apply apply methods to this. We, we start applying methods, and each of those methods will actually produce a new stream. And in the end, we are left with a stream of only one method, and then we can subscribe to that stream and do whatever we want with the result. As you can see, nothing special, right? Pretty easy. Back to our diagram. So in order to tackle scalability, we introduced a bunch of observable FP style methods, and we also started handling state transparently. Now let's talk about resilience. Uh, well, as I said, uh, my problem with, uh, with the classic OOP approach was that, was, was with, uh, was that uh, try catch is up to the client, and that resource cleanup is also up to the client. On the other hand, with RxJava, all the client has to do is implement the on-error method, uh, on method, and nothing else. So everything, uh, so all of this, try catch, resource cleanup, that's all up to the, uh, all up the producer. So the consumer just implements the on-error method, and that is it. Uh, that's right, a convenient thing for the client, for the consumer. And also, we made error a first-class citizen. Uh, how did we do that? Well, basically, when you implement a consumer, you need to implement the observer, inter uh, the observer interface. And one of the methods in the observer interface is the on-error method. So basically, your, co your code won't compile if you, if you don't implement that method, which is very nice, right? And this is all great. I mean, this is all great and nice and everything, but there is one problem. Uh, the problem is, that, as we said earlier, that uh, on-error method is a terminal method. So once our producer call, calls the consumer's on-error method, there will be no more messages from this producer. And sometimes that is fine, right? But sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we, we as a consumer would like to recover somehow from this error. 
And just for cases like those, the guys in Arx Java added a few handy methods to handle this. So for example, we have methods like on error return. Uh, this method will actually mask the on error call and instead produce one more message. Then we have a method like on error resume next, which will replace the faulty producer with a new, let's say, good one. And then we have, let's say, a Error, let's say we have then, for example, a retry method which will just, you know, restart the producer and restart the whole process again. Okay, back to our diagram. Uh, so in order to tackle resilience, we simplified basically error handling for consumer and we made error a first-class citizen. But as you can see here, uh, in my diagram, uh, resilience is not actually green. It's something between green and yellow. There's something in between. Why? Well, because, I mean, this is a good start. It's a great start, but it's not always enough, especially when you, especially when you, when you work with distributed systems. You know, then you have latency, latency and stuff like that, and then you could get into troubles. So we, uh, there, are, there are some libraries that can help you out with, with that. One of them is Hystrix. It's a Netflix, it was originally, it was originally a Netflix library. And this library can, can help you with uh, latency and fault tolerance and improve, improve, improve the resilience of your system. So, you know, check it out if you like. Okay, so now we handle everything, everything but responsiveness. So let's get responsible. Notice that we here is not a typo, it's a new word I'm trying to introduce to the community, right? Okay, so we need to be responsive to our client, right? And we also, be, uh, we also need to be responsive to our system or our resources. First, let's talk about responsiveness. Uh, well, we already improved that by improving scalability and resilience, right? Uh, but we still haven't ta uh, talked about asynchronous execution. Out of the box, not sure if you noticed, but out of the box, Arx Java is synchronous. Basically, it's, you know, it's blocking. And consumer and producer both execute on the same thread which could be a problem, right? Now, let's, let's see this on an example. Uh, let's say we have our main thread, and we have our main method on that main thread. And at one point, we call the observable.subscribe. What happens next? Well, our main method will, be, will, be, will, uh, stop, will get blocked, and our producer will start executing. And our producer will call some remote service to get data, then, uh, then a consumer's on next method will get called. Then a consumer will start executing. Then a consumer's uh, on completed method will get called. Then this method will execute. And only after all of this is done, only after both producer and consumer are finished, only then will our main method start executing again. And I mean, sometime, sometimes that's fine, but a lot of times it isn't. So now let's see how, how can we make this uh, asynchronous. Well, in order to do that, uh, Rx Java introduced two methods. So the first one is subscribe on. Uh, this method, uh, with this method, we define on which thread will our observable, our message producer, run on. And on the other side, we have, a, we have an observe on method. And with that method, we define on which thread will our message consumer work on. So we have subscribe on for message producer and observe on for message consumer. And as you can see, both of these methods actually take a scheduler as an input parameter. Uh, we, have a, we have a few predefined schedulers. One of them is immediate. This scheduler will actually block a caller's thread and start executing on that thread. Then we have a new thread scheduler, which will create a new thread and start executing on that thread. Then we have a trampoline scheduler, which will enqueue work on the calling thread. And then, and that's pretty important, we have uh, two thread pools. The first one is I.O. thread pool, uh, used for input-output tasks, and the second one is computation pool, used for computation tasks. Now, let's see this on an example. So back to our example, On this time we are using asynchronous, we are executing this asynchronously. So again, we have our main, my main my, my, we get, again, we have our main uh, thread and our main method on that thread. And we, again, we are calling the observable.subscribe. Only this time, we also called the subscribe on and the observe on. So the moment we call the subscribe, a thread will be retrieved from a pool of input-output threads, and our producer will start executing on that thread. Uh, also, the moment we call the, uh, we call the consumers on next method, a, will, a thread will be retrieved from a pool of computation threads, and our uh, consumer will start executing on that 
thread. And the same goes for the uncompleted method. So as you can see here, during all that time, our main method was completely unblocked and free to do whatever it likes. And also our producer ran on one thread and our consumer ran on the other thread. So as you can see, it's all nice and decoupled, right? Okay, so this is a, so this is basically a synchronous execution. This is how we can be more, even more responsive. Now that we talked about uh, responsiveness, let's talk about responsibility, about responsible client. Well, for me, being reactive isn't just about doing something fast. It's actually about not doing it at all. Or to be more precise, to do only what's necessary, okay? So we want to do, we want to execute only those, ta those tasks that the client actually needs, and nothing more. How do we do that? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if you noticed, but uh, observables, so our message producers, they work only when someone's listening. So, so we can have our observable instance, we can chain a bunch of, uh, a bunch of methods to that, to that uh, instance, but none of this will execute until we subscribe a consumer to that, uh, to that uh, chain. So until there's a consumer, nothing will be executed. So that's the first way to be, to be responsible. And the second, is, uh, the second way is calling the unsubscribe method when needed. Let's say that we have, let's, let's do an example of this. Let's say we have a producer and a consumer. And the uh, producer is sending messages to our consumer. But at one point, our consumer decides that he doesn't want to listen to, he doesn't want to listen to messages from this, produ from this producer anymore. You know? He's no longer interested in this producer's methods, uh, mess sorry, messages. Uh, it would be very wasteful of our resources if our producer kept pushing those messages down our consumer. So in order to avoid this problem, we can just call the unsubscribe method and basically cancel that communication. Uh, there are actually two flavors of, uns of unsubscribing. The first one is uh, unsubscribing from the outside. How do we do that? Uh, well, we do that, uh, as you can see, each time, we call the each time we call subscribe method on our observable instance, as a return, we get a subscription object. And we can just call unsubscribe on that subscription object. And that is it. So this is unsubscribing from the outside. Now let's see how can we uh, unsubscribe from the inside. So again, we have, uh, so again, we are calling subscribe on our observable instance. Uh, only this time, instead of creating a new observer, we create a new subscriber. Uh, we talked about subscriber earlier when we said that subscriber is an extended observer. Uh, one of those extended methods is the unsubscribe method. And using that unsubscribe method, we can just unsubscribe from our producer whenever we desire. And that is it. Pretty simple, right? Okay, so back to our diagram one last time. So in order to tackle uh, responsiveness, we introduced asynchronous execution, and we introduced the notion of resources on demand. I mean, actually, this asynchronous execution is also related to scalability, but it just look, you know, it, it looked nicer this way. So, <laughs> but you get the idea. Hopefully, you get the idea. And this is this. Uh, now let's do a recap uh, one more time. So in order to tackle messaging communication, we introduced observable and observer. In order to tackle scalability, we introduced a bunch of observable FP style methods, and we introduced the notion of transparent state through streams of messages. In order to tackle resilience, we simplified error handling for the client, and we introduced uh, and we made error a first class citizen. And the last thing, responsiveness, so we added a synchronous execution and resources on demand here. And this is it. So as you can see, uh, just by adding a touch of touch of Rx Java magic to our object-oriented paradigm, we actually came up with a, with a solution that is, I think, very, very reactive, right? It looks very nice. It's green, you know, it's good. <laughs> okay. Now Q&A, but with myself. <laughs> so this is, this is the only way that, I'll be, that I'm sure to know, to know the answers of questions. Uh, question number one. Okay, so Arc Java looks interesting, but where would I use it? You know, could you give me an example? Well, I thought you'd never ask. All right. Uh, well, the first and obvious example would be Android. So uh, Arc Java is very popular in Android. Uh, what's the reason? Uh, the reason? The reason behind that is the first, firstly, the Arc Android. I think that the primary reason is the Arc Android library. Basically, what they did there is. Uh, they wrapped everything into observables. So uh, view events, uh, broadcast events, UI elements, uh, everything is an observable there. 
and also they implemented the special, special uh, schedulers that are uh, compliant with uh, Android's uh, scheduling system, uh, Android's uh, trading system, you know. So all in all, um, they, they made uh, Arx Java very appealing and very, to, very easy to use to, uh, for Android, Android developers. But you know, as most, of you, as most of us know here, Android is not really Java, you know. I mean, it is Java, but it's not Java, right? It's something, something, it's something. Okay, so the, uh, the one truly Java example would be Netflix, of course. Hopefully they won't sue me for taking their, their logo here. Uh, actually, actually, Netflix, uh, the guys in Netflix uh, were the first one to implement Rx Java. So the first version of Rx Java is the Netflix's version. So what was the reasoning uh, for doing, uh, what was the reasoning for, do, uh, for implementing Rx Java and for using Rx Java? Okay, so they have, uh, they use Direct Java in their, uh, in their service layer, in their application layer. So this is the layer between the client and the backend uh, Netflix services. So we have uh, client is here, our, th that service layer is here, and all behind that are, and behind it are backend Netflix services. Okay, so what was the problem? Uh, let's say we have our user, user's name is let's say Jeff, something like that, and Jeff, let's say that Jeff wants to get a list of all sci-fi movies. So he makes a request, and now he waits. He waits. And finally the data is here. Okay, great. Um, as you can see, the wait was pretty long, huh? Uh, so what was the problem here? Uh, well, in order to, uh, to fully understand the problem, we need to, we need to look at the business uh, the net Netflix is in. I mean, uh, the ne business of Netflix is movies, uh, movies, TV shows, and stuff like that. So this is all, so these, are, these are all very large data sets and uh, very, he very heavy data sets, you know, very big data sets. I mean, they're larger on items and larger on memory, right? And so, uh, even with paging and everything, if you want to get a list of all the sci-fi movies, you know, first it would take a pretty, pre it would take pretty long time to actually assemble the list, and then it, it would take pretty long time to push that list back to our client. So as you can see, the wait is pretty long, especially if you're doing it in bulk, you know, especially if you, if you, are, if you are pushing the whole list or at least one page of that list, right away, you know, if, if the user needs to wait for the whole list before it, he can actually look at the list. So what they did is they, impl they used Arx Java. Uh, okay, so now let's, let's re revisit our example, only this time using Arx Java. So again, we have our Jeff. Again, Jeff makes a request, but what happens now? This is a little bit better, right? Now, what was the, now what, what was the idea here? Uh, basically, so as, as we said, uh, they implemented Rx Java in service in their service layer, and basically what they did here is they they made their service layer a producer of messages, and they made Jeff a consumer of messages, and they would just iter iteratively push messages down to down to our Jeff, you know, and so instead of, so, so instead of uh, having to wait for the whole list to be available at once, Jeff would, Jeff would start. Uh, uh, would start receiving uh, receiving those movies, basically the, those items, right away, one at a time. And even who knows, maybe maybe the maybe the maybe the assem assembly of the whole list, uh, well, to, to maybe the time that actually took to assemble the whole list was the same as before. But in Jeff's size, it was it was quicker. Why? Well, because he saw he start he started seeing the results right away. You know, because it was an iterative response. So uh, responsiveness was definitely better using Irish Java. Also, the benefit was, was, switching from, was switching from imperative way of programming to a declarative one. And once you get used to, used to the notion of declarative programming, uh, it's, uh, you, know, you can see that uh, declarative programming is actually, let's say, simple and much cleaner solution. And also, their code was, their code was more asynchronous. Why? Well, because uh, uh, um, 
Rx Java handles asynchronous uh, ex execution under the hood, so you don't have to worry about that. You just tell them, you, you just tell Rx Java that you want to be asynchronous and it does everything for you. You don't have to worry about uh, threads or locks or whatever, you know. So in the end, their code was prettier, let's say. It was more asynchronous and the response time was better because of this iterative, iterative response. And that's it for question one, right? Now question two. Okay, this is all fine and great, but we already have an existing app. Uh, where and how would we introduce RxJava into our app? Well, my, ex my advice would be to start small. Give yourself time to make the switch. And by switch, I don't mean the switch from uh, one, uh, from one uh, library to another. I mean a switch in the way of thinking. A switch from imperative to declarative, a switch from, uh, from synchronous to asynchronous. It takes some time, trust me. And then you can start to detect potential po points of improvement. So for example, uh, maybe you have a part of code that is already asynchronous, you know, uh, futures, completable futures, and stuff like that, you know. Uh, if, if, uh, if a project is old enough, each project has that part of code that is made, uh, that is implemented asynchronously, but nobody actually, uh, actually understands what it means, and nobody wants to touch it, you know. So may well, maybe you can try it, Try and touch it, try and refactor it using Irish Java. Uh, if you see an explicit usage of thread somewhere, you should definitely think of rewriting the, this code. If not with Irish Java, then at least use, use executor, executor service or something like that. I think that in this day and age, we should not use threads, you know, by ourselves explicitly. For example, or then, for example, if you have some long-running task, you know, maybe some computation or some communication process that takes a long time, can this be made asynchronous? I mean, uh, do you really need to be blocked while you're while you're waiting for the for the result? Who knows? Maybe yes, maybe no. If no, then try and do it with Arc Java. Uh, large queries. Uh, do you do you really need the whole data set? As we, as we talked. Uh, the, we mentioned that uh, when we talked about Netflix, you know, so if, if you have a very large data set, do you actually need the whole data, you know? Usually people just, just go through that data set, through that data set until they find something that they need. So maybe your data set could be returned iteratively, you know, one item at a time, and then when you find the item you are looking for, you can just cancel the whole, the, cancel the whole uh, communication. That way you would definitely, you would definitely save, yourself, save yourself some uh, resources, right? And the last thing is that you could just, if you have an API, you could just provide some additional async API. So you have a method X, you could just create a method X, X async. And then, you know, uh, your clients could slowly start using those async methods, you know, one step at a time, let's say it like that. But be cautious, so it's not all fun and games. Uh, first, learning curve is steep. So, okay, it takes some time. It takes some time to learn the whole, to switch, to make that switch, as I said. Uh, I know that the, uh, for the guys in Netflix, it took them three attempts to finally get it working. So, you know, it takes some time. Also, debugging is hard. Uh, uh, debugging of uh, declarative code is just hard. I mean, it is what it is. It's hard. That's it. And your old tests might not work. Especially if you are switching from a synchronous execution to an asynchronous one. Uh, your tests might not fail, but they sure as hell don't work, you know. So maybe it's green, but it still doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. And the last thing is don't get overexcited. That's, I, I think that's the most important, you know. That's the most important thing. Uh, so not everything should be reactive. Uh, people tend to, you know, when they learn, when they, when they get the hand, hang of Rx Java, they tend to do everything with Rx Java. I don't think that everything should be made Rx Java, so you know, choose your battles carefully. So as a summary, you know, start small, take, uh, give yourself time and go, you know, work towards, towards making your app more reactive. And the last question, okay, but uh, hey, isn't Java already equipped with all of this? I mean, we do have streams now. The short answer would be, no, it's not. Okay, no, it's not. Uh, Java streams are, they're sexy, you know, declarative over imperative. Uh, they, sim they definitely, definitely simplify iteration over collections. And they are pretty big on Lambda. And this is all great, this is fine, and this is, whew, 
this is super good, and I'm, I'm super happy to have lambdas. Uh, I'm sorry, to have Java 8 streams in Java 8, <laughs> but it's not a silly bullet. I mean, in the end, uh, Java 8 streams are just a convenient and efficient way to handle collection, and nothing more. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but this is it. Java 8 streams are just iterators over collections, a very, very good ones, but just that. Now let's do a quick, you know, now let's, let's pair up uh, Java 8 streams with their stream object versus RX, versus RX Java with the observable, the observable object. Okay, so stream, uh, streams are pool-based, uh, observables are push-based. What does it mean? Well, basically it means that uh, if you're a consumer, you'll, be, you'll pull data from the stream, uh, and on the other hand, uh, you, uh, an observable will push data to you. So streams pull, ba you pull data from streams, and an observable, observables push data to you. The next thing is uh, collections. So streams can be created out of collection, and basically that is, that is it, basically. Observables can be created out of anything. First of all, you have a whole bunch of predefined methods, and if not, then you can always create your own observable. It's not very hard. So streams can be used only once, and observables can be used multiple times. Uh, as we said, uh, streams, are uh, streams are basically just iterators. And you know that iterators can be used only once, right? And then you need to discard them. On the other hand, if you have an observable instance, you can attach who knows how many uh, consumers to that observable instance. It's not a problem. In streams, time-related operations are unsupported. So I mean, you know, intervals, uh, throttling, throttling uh, timeouts, and stuff like that. In, uh, in, in Arx Java, we have all of this. And the last thing is that streams are very, and I mean very, very limited in their composition, compositioning capabilities, while on, while on the other hand, you can basically com uh, compose Arx Java observables however you like. There's a whole bunch of methods to do that, and as I said, if not that, then you can always create your own you know, composer. So they are really, really good with that, and also they handle synchronization internally. So you don't have to worry about that. About that you know, com uh, you know, just synchronizing uh, elements from one stream uh, with elements from another stream and stuff like that. So it's pretty easy to do that. So summary of the question number three would be: No, streams are not Arx Java, and no, <laughs> you cannot just use streams instead of Arx Java. It's a whole, it's a whole different thing. And that would be it. Thank you for your time. Uh, this time Q&A, but f this time for real. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> or have I said everything and answered to every possible question? Yes. Uh, I can just repeat the question if you want. How do you avoid uh, Nesting of callbacks, of callbacks, of callbacks, of callbacks, I mean, co like uh, what happens currently in Java with uh, maybe with completable, have. completable futures and stuff like that. Like in, on a next callback, mm -hmm. you need to do some work, which depends on the data that comes in. Okay, and then you call another observable. Okay. Which has another own next method, uh -huh. and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, so so basically, so, so basically, so you would say that you have two observables, and how to how to how to. Is there any way to make the code which works with the observables like more looking more like synchronous code, something like yield or ah, you, you await mean, you, you or mean, this you mean kind of even though even though these. Uh, these uh, tasks execute asynchronously. Could you could you just you know monitor? Could you just make sure that they execute one uh, one after the other? Yeah, like sugaring of the syntax. I'm sorry. I'm sure. Like sugaring over the syntax of the okay. code. I haven't. Uh, I don't understand the last part. It's, it's sugaring, but all in all, you could. Yes, of course, you could. You could. Uh, you can. Uh, you can uh, chain that together, and you can make uh, observable tasks as you execute. In the in the way that you want them, in the order that you want them, it's not a problem. Uh, you can just, like as I said, 
usually that would be a few observables, and there are special methods that, that will, you know, uh, wait. For example, uh, one observable will wait for the other observable to finish or to do something to, I don't know, produce at least one message, and then it will start executing and stuff like that, if that's what you meant. So you have this, you have this. Uh, Thank uh, you. Okay. Okay, one question from my mm -hmm. side. Uh, okay, uh, you said uh, it's a push-based, so yeah. in this situation, if the producer is uh, producing in a faster pace uh, than the consumer may consume, oh, okay, we okay. have asynchronous uh, messages. Uh, this is called back pressure. I didn't want to talk about it because, you know, it's, uh, maybe it's not an introduction or anything. But this is, a, this is a problem, and there are ways to address this. Uh, well, basically, there are mechanisms, uh, and RxJava comes with certain mechanisms to do that. Uh, you have two ways to approach this. Either, well, either you do some sort of buffering, you know, because you know, maybe, you have, maybe right now maybe you have a burst of, of these messages, but later it will be OK, you know, so you'll just buffer them, or uh, you'll just have to discard them. This guy, yeah. Okay, yeah. but uh, this links to the second question. Okay, if you use uh, Archix Java, let's say, for a business process where you need transactions, and uh, if you decouple everything to messages, are there some safe way, let's say, to know this has happened or this has failed Oof, uh, in order to, to repeat or not? Well, I, would like to, I would like to stop right there. Um, sorry. Uh, I don't think... Um, I'm not sure that uh, RxJava would be a best fit for, uh, for transactions because uh, I, mean, I think that uh, transactions are just on, the, just on a different uh, spectrum of, uh, of what RxJava tries to do. So basically, uh, transactions tend to group, group you know, uh, work together, while on the other hand, uh, RxJava tries, to, tries to, uh, to granulate, to work as much as it can, you know, basically to a okay, point of one not message. not transaction exactly, but more to be sure that uh, something has already been processed to not repeat it twice or something like? Well, it will not be repeated. Uh, well, um, I think that you just, you just need to, uh, if it were me, you know, it's uh, hypothetical. I would, I would just, I would start with buffering and still the, then, and you, there are certain, you know, uh, there are certain ways that you can uh, notify, you can notify yourself or some, whoever uh, that, something like this happened, and I would just need to see, you know, where's the problem and how to resolve it. I mean, there's no, un unfortunately, there's no silver bullet, you know, sorry. Okay. okay. At least not that I know of. Thank you very much for your I answers. Okay, it's something. Uh, sure. The question is, re reactive streams are a big deal now. Uh, Java is not the only. No, uh, so reactive streams are a big deal now, right? But uh, Eric's Java is not the only option. Why would we choose like uh, you, you've made the comparison with Java 8 streams? But why would we choose to use Eric's Java instead of Project Reactor or Arca streams or or anything else that is well, kind of doing the the same? The, you get the same end yeah, result, but yeah, using yeah, different yeah. Tools. Uh, well, like um, for, unfortunately, since I, I only worked with Eric's Java, I cannot answer that. Sorry. But all in all, just so that we're all on the same page, so yeah, react reactive streams are actually a specification. I think that it should be actually an implementation of reactive streams, I think should be part of Java 9. Some, they mentioned something like that. There is something it, reactive stream commons or something like that? Yeah, they, they mentioned something like that. So basically, uh, an er uh, reactive stream are, um, uh, basically reactive streams try to, try to make a specification of the things that are Java and the other reactive extensions based libraries are already doing, you know. So maybe you'll hear about reactive streams when Java 9, Java 9 comes out. And sorry, for your question, I only worked with, I only worked with Chinese Java, sorry. I have one more question. I would like to return to the, this example with science fiction movies and this okay. iterative uh, okay. um, response. Are there any libraries in JavaScript that uh, helps us to implement? Yeah, some? there's actually Rx Java. Oh, sorry, Rx JavaScript. Okay, so we using on server side Rx Java and. On okay, so so you you would uh, I would I personally would use I would use uh, Rx Java on the server side. I would let's say if, if you use Spring, let's say if you use Spring, uh, there's a there's a thing called deferred result. Uh, basically. Um, 
since uh, I think it's server 3.0, I think, I'm not sure, but I think since uh, server 3.0, uh, you can have uh, uh, asynchronous uh, HTTP requests, you know, so the server supports that, and uh, basically uh, Spring, le uh, Spring uh, leverages on that. So, so you would use Rx Java, you would use Spring, uh, Spring uh, asynchronous execution, and on the client side you would use Rx RxJS, and then it would all flow smoothly, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is that it? Okay, then thank you very much. Thank you very much for the great presentation.